Module 9, Creating and Managing Content Types. In this module, we'll talk about what content types are, what's their purpose, why are they useful. From there, we'll shift the conversation to creating and using site content types. And finally, we'll talk about associating site columns or metadata with site content types. Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome back. We've spent a lot of time talking about efficiency, the idea of do it once, never do it again. And there was perhaps no better example of that kind of efficiency than templates. Whether it was list and library templates, where we were able to duplicate exact custom metadata and structure, but also site templates, which allowed us to not just duplicate lists and libraries, but everything else within a site as well to be used over and over and over again. The problem, specifically with these kinds of templates, is they're incredibly rigid. If we were going to, for the sake of argument, build a library off of a library template, we're limited to exactly how that library was when we saved it as a template. That also means that if we need other metadata from other styles of libraries because they're dealing with similar content, we have to add that metadata in ourselves because you can't build a library based on two separate templates. Well, fortunately for us, we don't actually have to do that. Instead, we can turn our attention to a new tool that we're gonna talk about here today called content types, which this idea of unifying different kinds of content like legal contracts, marketing proposals, product design specifications. These documents are wildly different, but they may share some small set of common properties. But within that, they might also have their own unique attributes that need to be created, used, and shared. So content types allow us to say, based on certain types of objects, based on whatever certain type of content this may be, we would like to collect certain pieces of metadata, all within the same library. So it's almost like templatizing metadata. It's also templatizing workflows. It can also be used to really customize the library experience. And so that's what we're gonna talk about here today. Let's go ahead and jump right into it. So in order to best understand content types, let's create one and see what the process looks like. We'll talk about it throughout the way. To create a new content type, we're gonna need to jump into site settings. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on the gear here in the top right corner and jump right into site settings. Here in site settings, of course, there's a ton of different tools that are at our disposal here. What we're looking for are site content types. So if you've taken our end user series, you already know about site columns or site-wide metadata. And likewise, we've been kind of chipping away at all these different other areas within the web designer galleries, including the list templates where all of our list and library templates are hiding, the solutions gallery where all of our site templates are hiding. So site content types is a natural next step here in this process. Having clicked on site content types, what you're currently looking at here are all the default content types that are currently utilized here within this SharePoint implementation. And you'll see there's quite a few familiar ones like a wiki page or a web part page or a site page, videos, document sets, discussion folders. So there's a lot of different content types that already exist based on the default list and library templates that are already available for us out of the box. What we'd like to do, however, is create our own new content type. Go ahead and pause the video and join me here. As a reminder, we went to the gear and selected site settings. Within site settings, underneath the web designer galleries column, we selected site content types and then clicked create. So go ahead and pause the video and join us here. Welcome back. For this example, we're gonna build a content type that is an HR form to request time off. So here in the name, I'm gonna go ahead and call this the PTO request. In the description, I'll go ahead and say content type 
related to HR forms. In fact, we'll go ahead and call this HR request because we might want to scale this to other HR request forms down the road. When it comes to the types of contents, whether it's the parent content type uh, category or the actual content type, it's important to note that most of these are very, very specific based on the style of medium you'll utilize content types for. So if it's going to be something that is, let's say, interactive, you might choose digital asset content types. That's audio, images, videos. But if you're going to be doing something that's a bit more conventional, like files and forms and documents, then you'll want to choose the document content types. And from there, the parent content type within that, we'll go ahead and choose document. Now this is simply for the sake of organizing it, creating a foundation for what kind of content type we'll be working with. By choosing the right content type parent, we can actually start off on the right foot with the appropriate defaults that we can then go back and customize later. So this content type is gonna be titled HR request. The group, or forgive me, the parent content type is going to be document content types, document. And finally, underneath group, we're gonna store this in the custom content types. Although, if you do end up creating a lot of these, it might be in your best interest to create new groups to start organizing these a bit more effectively. So you might call this one the your company here documents. So having that kind of contextual specificity when organizing might make things easier for you down the road. In this case, however, I'm gonna go ahead and stick with custom content types and click OK. The process of creating a content type can take a moment, so feel free to, you know, take a walk, stretch your legs, grab a cup of coffee. Go ahead and pause the video here and join us where we've gotten to thus far. We've clicked within site content types, create, and we've created a new content type called HR request. We'll see you after the break. Now that we've got our content type created, it's time to start customization. Right now, this content type is just a blank document. Kind of boring, relatively unremarkable, and certainly not specific to our organization, our project, our business. Taking a look at your HR request content type that we just created, keep in mind that you can customize the name later, as well as recategorize the group if you decide that you do want to get really custom with the groups later. You can associate specific workflows with this, but in this case, we're gonna keep it simple. We're going to turn our attention to the affiliated metadata that's related to this particular content type. You'll see that there are already two columns associated with this content type, name and title. Name, of course, is required, and it'll come from the name of the file. But title isn't necessarily required. In fact, we may not necessarily feel like we need the title metadata. To manage that, Click on the name of the column. From here, you can customize whether or not this is a hidden field. Maybe this is required. Maybe we really want the title. And most importantly, if this content type is already associated with any list or libraries, do we want to update all content types that are referring to this content type? And in that example, you always want to say yes. In this example, I'm going to go ahead and select hidden and click OK. So hidden means that it's not a question that will be asked when you're uploading a file. What I'm going to do from here is I'm going to go ahead and add in some other existing site columns. Now, when you click on add from existing site columns, it's here that you get to decide what metadata that already exists is relevant to this specific content type. Do keep in mind that when you select add from existing site columns, the loading process does take an unusually long time. So give it a brief moment. Once it loads, you can search through all the different groups of columns that are already available. If you've taken the end user portion of SharePoint, you can always check your custom columns to see if there's any columns here that are relevant to your specific organization. In this case, I've got my Learn It division metadata. So whenever we submit 
this form, I would like to know which division is this related to. So I'm going to select that and click Add. From here, I'm going to go ahead and click OK. Keep in mind that you can add as many columns of metadata as you'd like based on that specific content's need. You'll notice that by default, it's optional. But if you'll remember, when we click on it, we can actually say, actually, this is required in this specific instance, and click OK. Of course, if you add a column in error, you can always remove it here on this screen as well. So go ahead and try that. Pause the video and add from existing site columns and choose a metadata field and make it required. If you don't have a metadata field that you'd like to add, feel free to add a new site column here. We'll see you after the break. So congratulations, you've now associated metadata with this content type. So when we take this content type and pin it to a library, that library will now ask for that specific metadata when this file is attached. On that note, however, what files are being attached that may be affiliated with this content type? Well, users, of course, could upload their own content and then associate it with this content type, but we also might want to be helpful and provide for them these forms for them to fill out here. And so it's here that we'll go into advanced settings to associate form templates that users can then use to add their items to this library that we will eventually associate with some other library. So I'm going to go ahead and select advanced settings. Here in advanced settings, it says specify the document template for this content type. Now, of course, if you have a URL for an existing document template, you can go ahead and enter it there. Or if you already have a file, you can upload it. So I'll go ahead and browse. And I happen to have a PTO request form here on my desktop. So I'll go ahead and attach that. Should this content type be read only? I don't think so. If this is a form, we want them to be able to touch it. And likewise, once again, do we want to update all content types inheriting from this type? This simply means that as we make changes to this in the future, do we want these other libraries to retroactively apply these changes? And in this case, we'll continue to say yes. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. So what's happening right now is it's actually uploading that file and it's establishing it as a form in this content type. In fact, if I go into advanced settings, there it is. I can even click on edit template and see what that template is going to look like. It may ask you to sign in. And there it is. Here's my PTO request form. I can actually make changes to it here if I want to, just to make sure that it meets my specific needs. In this case, it looks good. I'll go ahead and close it out. I'll click OK. Go ahead and pause the video here. Remember, we assigned a document template for this specific content type by going to Advanced Settings and uploading the document template there. Go ahead and do just that. We'll see you after the break. Now that we've built out this content type, we've associated the relevant metadata, we've even attached an associated document to be used as a template if the user needs, it's time to take this content type and associate it with an existing library. To do so, we need to go find a library. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on the gear here in the top right corner, and I'm gonna go to Site Contents. I can retroactively associate it with any existing library, but for this example, I'll go ahead and create a new library, and I'll call this the HR Reception. I'll go ahead and leave it in navigation. Notice I'm following the rules. Once again, camel case, no space, no special characters, and I'm gonna click Create. Don't forget, you can always clean up the username later. Simply go into Library Settings, List name and description. And there you go. 
Go ahead and pause the video. Create a new document library for your content type and join me here in that library's library settings. Managing content types is not for the lighthearted, especially if you've never done it before, which is why you have these videos. But that also means that Microsoft makes a point of hiding it. So content types are not easy to edit unless you know how to turn on that view. So here in library settings, we're gonna jump into advanced settings and give it a click. At the very top of advanced settings, you'll see the ability to allow management of content types. So I'm gonna go ahead and say yes, and scroll down and click okay. Now you'll notice where I did have the columns section before, I now have the content types section. Columns has been bumped down just a little bit. Go ahead and pause the video and turn on manage content types. Remember that's in advanced settings of the library settings and it's the top toggle. Go ahead and set that to yes and join me here. Now that we've enabled the ability to manage content types, it's time to add from existing site content types. So now you're starting to see, hopefully, why we had to create this content type first, because now it's simply a matter of assigning it to this library. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on add from existing site content types. From here, I'm gonna go ahead and change the group to custom content types. And there's my HR request site content type. I'll simply select it and click add and click okay. You can assign as many content types to a library as you need. Now that I've set this HR request as a content type, what I'd like to do now is set it as the default content type. To change the default content type, you'll need to turn your attention to the change new button order and default content type. You cannot delete the default content type. So we need to set this as the new default so that we can remove this one. So I'm gonna go ahead and select change new button order and default content type. Whatever is in position one, is the default content type, don't believe me? It says it right here. The first content type will be the default. And I'll click okay. Now that I've done that, I can select document, scroll down to the bottom, and delete this content type. Keep in mind that deleting it isn't actually deleting it, it's simply removing it from this library. So check it out. There's my HR request content type. Go ahead and pause the video and join me here. Remember, we selected add from existing site content types. We selected the content type that we just created. We changed the order so that HR request or whatever content type you've created is number one so that we could then delete the default content type that was provided, go ahead and give it a shot. We'll be right here. It's time to see our hard work in action. To get back to your library, simply click on the name of the library here in the top left corner, utilizing the breadcrumb trails. Of course, if you've also put it in the quick launch, you can click on it there as well. From here, all you have to do to access your content type is simply click new and check it out. The ability to create a new folder. You'll notice you don't see Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote. Instead, you see the single template provided for that content type. And if I click on it, because it's a template that is a form, it's gonna load it up here in Word Online and I can actually make changes to it here on my computer. So I'm gonna go ahead and sign in here. For those of you that may use Microsoft Word to build your forms out, it's important to note that if you do lock Microsoft Word, you're not gonna be able to edit it in the web. So I'll go ahead and populate this form.
Once you've completed your form, if you're editing it in the desktop, remember, if you've required any metadata, you'll get a pop-up that looks just like this. Simply click Go to Document Properties, and you can customize it all here. In this example, I'm going to go ahead and say that I'm part of the End User Training Division. Remember that metadata that we required earlier? You can customize all that and more here on the right-hand side in your Metadata Properties field. So remember, if you do require metadata, you can even populate it here in the desktop. From there, simply click OK. We'll go ahead and save it. And there you go. So I'm going to go ahead and jump back to the document library here and check it out. There's my Sean PTO file. So I was actually able to click on new, fill out a form and have it submitted. Now, do bear in mind that the process can be a lot smoother if you don't use Microsoft Word for your form generation. And on top of that, just as a quick side note, perhaps a word to the wise, when utilizing Microsoft Word, if you're going to submit something as a template, do not use the protect tools because that can cause some challenges when editing in the web. So with that having been said, go ahead and pause the video and try this for yourself. Click on new, select your new document template and fill it out. If there's any required metadata, remember, go to file and populate the metadata fields here in properties. It's that easy. If you're worried about users getting confused by required metadata, feel free to not require metadata. You can always go back in at any time and say, I don't need to require this. Go ahead and pause the video, and we'll see you after the break. Module 10, Understanding Delve. In this module, we'll discuss managing your About Me. We'll talk about following and discovering documents. We'll discuss the creation of boards to manage your followed documents. And finally, we'll talk about utilizing blogs effectively. Let's go ahead and get started. We've talked a lot about working in one single SharePoint environment, but that's not to say that that is the entire SharePoint experience. Part of the SharePoint experience is bringing it all together, stepping up above everything at 10,000 feet and being able to see everything that SharePoint has to offer for you across all sites that you're a part of. And likewise, what you are contributing into that. And so it's with that that we're actually going to move away from this particular SharePoint site. But not before. I follow it. To follow any site, simply click on the star in the top right corner. If you're already following it, it'll say you're already following this site. But otherwise, it will say now following this site. So where are your followed sites? Well, that brings us to what's happening above all of this. What's happening beyond this particular SharePoint site? So we're going to go ahead and turn our attention to you here in the top right corner. If you click on your icon here in the top right, you'll see a couple of different things, including About Me. Go ahead and find About Me and give it a click. If you keep an eye on the URL, you'll notice that we are no longer in SharePoint's sandbox site, at least not the sandbox site that we were in just a moment ago. We are now in a URL subdomain called Delve. Delve is Microsoft's collaborative platform that brings together all the content stored in OneDrive and SharePoint. Go ahead and pause the video and get to your About Me. We'll see you after the break. This is your Delve About Me profile. It contains any recent documents you've been working on. It has access to your Outlook calendar. It's here that you can update your profile to provide information on what projects you're currently working on. What kind of information do you have that's available for contact? What kind of skills and expertise do you have? All these different things can be useful in a collaborative organization where everybody is constantly reaching out to everyone else. So you can populate your About Me with useful information so that when people do find you in Delve, they have a better perspective on who you are. Of course, you can also do fun little things like changing your cover photo. You can also customize the overall theme of Delve 
by clicking on the gear here in the top right corner and going to theme. So here in theme, I can actually decide whether or not I want this Lego brick theme with a robot. So you can have a little bit of fun with this here every now and again. Feel free to get creative with it. Once you've chosen your theme, make sure that you click save. Very common mistake. Beyond the ability to customize your profile, it's also here that you'll see web links to your OneDrive directly. Of course, you can also access your OneDrive by clicking on the waffle icon here in the top left hand corner and simply selecting OneDrive. It's also here that you can customize your user profile image. Not all organizations allow you to change this picture, so this may be set at the Active Directory level. If you're not seeing that photo icon here on the left-hand side, you are not able to do it. Go ahead and pause the video, and if you'd like, update some of your Delve About Me profile. So Delve is the unifying factor that brings documents from OneDrive and SharePoint, all SharePoint sites that you have access to, together. Now you might have already noticed your recent documents here, in my instance, are referencing things from my demos. So there's that PTO form that I just filled out in the content types lesson. Here's files that were generated when I built out the subsite Operation Irish Breakfast. Of course, as you scroll down, you can even see other individuals that you work with. And even further down, other files that other people around you are currently working on that you have permission to access. So this is an important thing to highlight here. You will only see documents that you have access to. And likewise, other users who may see files that you upload will only ever see them if you've explicitly shared that file with them. If you're not sure why you're seeing a file, click on the ellipses in the bottom right of any file and select who can see this. This will actually take you to where the file is and tell you who has access to it. In this case, a fair amount of people. So this will always give you some semblance of an understanding as to who's being granted access to specific files. For example, Sean PTO, I might wanna know who can see that I requested time off? In this case, there are a handful of people. As long as they're the HR representatives, I might be comfortable with that. But of course, if at any point I realize eh, that's too many people, I can actually manage that by selecting stop sharing. So the Delve profile is trying to highlight what it considers relevant content to you. Of course, you can for yourself also decide what's relevant. So maybe I wanna keep an eye on this PTO file. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on the little icon here in the bottom left, add to favorites. Having added it to favorites, it's now populated here in my favorites view. Of course, I can also search for files utilizing the search tool here in the top left-hand corner. By clicking in the search box, I'll go ahead and search the word coffee. You'll notice that it's found two different files that contain the word coffee in the title. However, if I click on show more results, it'll also show me files that have the word coffee within it. Pretty cool. On the right hand side, it's telling us at every juncture, where is this file located? If I click on see all results, it'll go even further out. So you can see here that I see files that are being stored by other individuals, shared with me by other people, or are simply more available to us all because of the permissions that they've granted us. If you click on the drop down here, you can filter it based on people. So let's say for the sake of argument, I search for the dashingly handsome Sean Bugler. If I click on the name, it'll actually take me directly to his profile. I can see any recent files that he's uploaded that I might need access to. I can also see any blog posts that he's recently written. Pretty cool. So let's say for the sake of argument here, this project coffee bean file is highly relevant to me. So I'm gonna go ahead and favorite it. Favoriting documents can easily get really overwhelming really quickly. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do here is I'm actually gonna go ahead and favorite a couple of other things here.
And now that I've favorited a few files, I'm gonna go ahead and check out my favorites. So here are all of my favorites. And you can see here that as you start to favorite more and more content, things are gonna get overwhelming. So Microsoft has implemented something called boards. For those of you that use Pinterest, this is not far off from that Pinterest style structure. But before we get to that, go ahead and pause the video. Favorite a few items, explore delve, search people, search text, find out why it is that you can see this, including who can see this. And then join us here in favorites. Now that I favorited a few things, I'd like to start organizing because not everything can be a favorite. They might just be things that I'm trying to keep my eye on. So this Excel data sheet, for example. To add something as a board, simply click Manage Boards, which is just to the right of the favorite icon. By clicking on Manage Boards, simply click in a box that says Add to a Board and type the name of a board you'd like to add. In this case, we'll call this one the Project Coffee Bean Board. You'll notice that as soon as I press the Enter key, it becomes a little tag. And now there's a section called Boards here on the left-hand side. Now that it's been boarded, I'm gonna go ahead and unfavorite it. Because I don't actually need it to be in favorites, I just need it to be somewhere I can find it later. So I'll go ahead and find a couple more items here. Project Coffee Bean. Unfavorite. There we go. A document called Project Coffee Bean. Project Coffee Bean. You're not limited to just one board either. If this one was related to, let's say for the sake of argument, Project Coffee Bean and Project Tea Leaf, I can do that. And once again, I'll go ahead and unfavorite. You don't have to unfavorite it, I just wanna be clear that you can. That the purpose of boards can easily be to help distill your favorite documents down to just your actual favorite documents, things that you really need to keep your eye on. To view your boards, simply on the left-hand side, give your board a click, or if you're in your favorites and it's a favorite board, click on it there. This will show you any documents that have been added to your board. Pretty cool. You can easily say this isn't my favorite board, however. So let's say Project Coffee Bean is an older project. I don't need to see it anymore, but if I need to reference it later, I'd like to. So if I click Remove from Favorites, you'll notice that it's actually been taken off of here on the left-hand side. And if I go to favorites, you'll notice it's not there as well. Go ahead and pause the video. Create a board, add a few documents to that board, unfavorite a few documents, and then create a second board and unfavorite that entire board. To find a board that you've unfavorited, that you need to find again, or likewise, to find a board that someone else has created that you'd like to see, simply click in the search box and type the name of the board, like Project Coffee Bean. If it doesn't pop up in the list here down below, click Show More Results. You'll see any boards that meet that criteria here on the right-hand side. Simply click on it, and if you'd like, re-add to favorites. You can also share this board with anybody. As it notes here, boards are open to everyone. Of course, not all documents are gonna be open to everyone, but at least the documents that they can see will appear in these boards. Go ahead and pause the video. Re-add that board that you just unfavorited and experiment with the send a link. Another major facet of the Delve platform is the blog. I went ahead and searched this individual here, Sean Bugler. He's a good looking guy. And you'll notice that he's already populated some blogs here. Now, of course, you can click on here to view all posts. This will take you directly to Sean's personal blog view. Now, of course, personal is not in relation to it actually being personal content. It simply means content that was generated explicitly by Sean. The whole point of blogs can be well, whatever you want them to be. It's simply about how would you like to contribute information? Is this information relevant? Do you get asked the same question over and over and over again? If so, it might be your, to your benefit to create a blog post. 
Then, as people ask that question, simply provide a link to that blog. Blog posts can also be about project management. You can use them easily as a way of keeping track of what you've done, what have your holdups been. It can be about personal accountability. So I can easily click on new post here. If you've never used your blog, you may get this pop-up screen. So give it just a moment. And there it is. It's time to build your blog post. You can add an image if you'd like, whether it's a photo that's stored in OneDrive or something that's stored directly on your computer. Keep in mind that you'll wanna give it a pretty sizable photo. So for example, if you were to use this photo, which is a low resolution one, you'll notice it gets a little pixelated. It still works. It may not necessarily be great, however. Beyond that, go ahead and add a title. So for those of you that work in project management, you might speak in sprints. So you might use blog posts to illustrate your challenges and successes, as opposed to an all staff email that can easily get lost in the clutter. Sending people a link or referring them to a blog post can be a great way to share this information. And if you'll notice, the structure is eerily similar to the structure of a site page in SharePoint, up to the plus icon where you can add text, quotes, images, videos, even preview documents. When all is said and done and you've added your content, remember to click save. Now, all changes are saved in real time. However, if you've made a pretty big change, you'll wanna make sure to click save. Fortunately for us, it'll tell us when posts are unpublished. To publish them, simply click on it again, select edit, and click publish. And just like that, if I go to my about me, In just a few moments, that blog will populate here. In the meantime, of course, you can click all posts, but keep an eye out. It's coming, and it's a great way to share information. It looks great. You don't have to be a graphic designer. So if nothing else, give blogs a shot. Go ahead and pause the video, and if you'd like, build your first blog post. Remember, we went to About Me. That brought us into our Delve profile. From there, Click New Post. If you've never clicked on New Post before and you've never visited your blog, it may take a moment to load. But once it's loaded, give it a shot. And that brings us to the end of our scheduled content. SharePoint is an incredibly powerful platform. It is as powerful as we are creative. But with the right tools, the right know-how, and a little bit of guidance, it can be whatever you need it to be on an organization-wide scale, on a project-wide scale, even on a personal scale. Feel free to review these videos as needed. You're now in a position to get up and running as a site owner, site admin, or just content creator. Thanks again for watching. My name has been Sean Bugler. Thanks for watching. Don't forget we also offer live classes in office applications, professional development, and private training. Visit learnit.com for more details. Please remember to like and subscribe and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for choosing Learn It.